Maddie Perez, Nate Jacobs, and Cassie Howard, the love triangle that came out of nowhere in season two and imploded spectacularly during episodes five and six. You're fucking Nate? Are you kidding me? No, I... <laughs> While this scene made for some spicy drama, today I want to dig a bit deeper and analyse how Euphoria constructed all three characters up to that moment. But before we jump in, I'd like to start this video by saying, number one, I'll be discussing probably the most toxic, emotional and physically abusive relationship in the show, so if you think this may be traumatic to you, please skip this one. And number two, if you want to join the conversation down below, that'd be awesome, it'd be great to talk to you guys, and it helps push these videos out there, so thanks in advance. And with that being said, let's start with breaking down the undisputed beautiful queen bee on campus, Maddie Perez. Confident, aggressive and calculated, everybody loves Maddie. For as long as Maddie could remember, everybody loved her. Her goal in life is to do nothing. She wants to be the doting trophy wife with the freedom to do what she wants, when she wants. This obviously comes at the expense of satisfying some dumb guy, but Maddie was happy with this trade-off, considering the alternative, the lives of her parents, much worse. She quickly realized that there are two kinds of people in the world. The people who sit in the chairs with their feet in the footbath, and the people who kneel in front of the footbath. This feeds into the bigger theme in Euphoria of every character being so impressionable when it comes to the lives of their parents. Rue's dad died, which indirectly leads to her drug addiction. Jules' mum abandoned her, which seems to have created relationship anxiety whenever she gets too close to someone. We don't know much about Kat's parents, but we can assume that her quest for independence is a rebellion against their mundane suburban existence, and Nate's dad, well, we'll get to that soon. Anyway, Maddie finds her soulmate in Nate, with this relationship the definition of toxic. They break up and get back together multiple times, using other people as pawns to make each other jealous, cheating on one another, with the relationship eventually devolving into physical abuse. Yet even when this happens, Maddie seemingly can't quit Nate. It wasn't the violence that scared her. It was the fact that she knew no matter what he did, she'd still love him. While this could be construed as some messed up romantic Stockholm syndrome, it feels like Maddie isn't in love with Nate himself. She's in love with the idea of Nate and the aforementioned freedom he can provide her. Again, I don't really know how to read this relationship as it's extremely counterintuitive. Obtaining freedom through an overly restrictive relationship? I don't know, but no matter what, it's definitely unhealthy. Maddie, get up. No. Just get up. Why? Can you stop being such a fucking cunt and just come dance with me, please? In order to discuss these feelings, Maddie often confides in her best friend, Cassie. Cassie Howard is a sweet, likeable girl who values relationships above all else. While she clearly cares for her friends, she is prone to making bad decisions when overwhelmed by her need to please her partners. As Rue puts it, She fell in love with every guy she ever dated. This all stems from being abandoned by her father at a young age, with Cassie projecting her need for paternal love on her relationships. The desperation to fill this void leads to her willingness to do whatever her boyfriends want, which, as you could expect, leads to her being labelled a slut by many of the boys at school. So Cassie's a whore. Fact. And this is where we meet McKay, her college boyfriend. I absolutely hated this relationship. On the surface, it seems like McKay cares for Cassie, but then he seems ashamed of her reputation. Like, whatever the fuck you've done. What have I done, McKay? Why oh, you gotta make everything so sexual? before trying to capitalize on her sexual proclivity. This then culminates in him demanding that she get an abortion at the end of season one. So yeah, he's an asshole, with his character basically a microcosm of men who want to shame women for their sexual appetite, while demanding that the woman then satisfies their needs. It's yuck. Anyway, this is probably a good time to discuss a lot of commentary claiming that Euphoria glorifies violent and sexually predatory behavior. <laughs> The main crux of a lot of these arguments is, hey, these are incredibly good looking people and the show is a stylized version of reality which looks really pretty. Therefore, people argue that kids watching the show will see good looking people doing something and try and emulate them. You know, like how teenagers will watch the new Spider-Man and then immediately jumped off a roof? If you're just looking at a poster of Euphoria, sure, I can see how you could come to that conclusion. The name itself is a reference to the high Rue chases when she takes drugs, so yes, the instinctive reaction is, hey, it's promoting drug use. But if you watch the show, I don't know how you can conclude that it glorifies anything. While they're shown going to parties and having relationships, usually positive things in coming of age shows, every single character is objectively miserable. Are you okay? 
You are so fucking stupid, Lexi. They're teens making horrific mistakes with families being torn apart by drug use, violence, lying, blackmail, and more drug use. I dare someone to watch season two, episode five and tell me with a straight face that it will make kids want to take drugs. It won't. It's one of the most harrowing hours of TV I've ever watched. Fucking, put the fucking phone down. Where did you put it? Where'd you put my pills, mom? Where did you put Another aspect of the show that receives a lot of criticism is the over-sexualization of the characters, particularly our girl Cassie. Cassie, portrayed by the wonderful Sydney Sweeney, has the most sex scenes in the show. And again, some people criticize the amount of sex scenes, claiming that it glorifies the characters' lifestyles. Some even go as far as to say the sex scenes have been filmed like cinematic pornography, framing these relationships as an aspirational romance rather than a dangerous sexual encounter. A couple of points on this. Number one, just because a scene is shot well doesn't mean it's celebrating the subject matter. Taking it back to our lame Spider-Man metaphor, when Tom Holland dies in Avengers, it looks pretty cool. It's a sad moment, but that doesn't mean the producers were compelled to make it look like garbage. The quality of a shot doesn't have to reflect the intended emotional response. The production quality in Euphoria is consistently impressive with an almost dreamlike glaze over every scene. It's airbrushed reality with incredibly grim subject matter. And this brings me to number two. A lot of the scenes are shot like this because they're meant to emulate how the character views the experience. I can imagine starting a family with you. The reality could be completely different to what we're being shown with the scene or visual representation of the lens of the character. And this brings me to number three. You can't take these scenes out of context. I thought you hated Nate. When I didn't know him. As discussed, the show outlines Cassie's lack of consistent parental figures. Her dad left them and her mom is a drunk, which has resulted in her crippling separation anxiety. As Rue puts it, She didn't like to be alone. Therefore, when she's having sex, Cassie is getting the ultimate level of connection she craves. It's a positive visual representation of what has been established as an unhealthy part of Cassie's life. Therefore, some sex scenes look romantic because Cassie is idolizing the relationship, but we as an audience have been shown that the relationship relationship is incredibly unhealthy. You can all judge me if you want, but I do not care. I have never, ever been happier. I'd also add that not every Cassie sex scene is portrayed positively. She's shown crying during sex, distraught when going to an abortion clinic, and her need for companionship manifests itself in this insane montage as she tries to get the attention of Nate. If these sex scenes are viewed in the totality of the show and character development again, I don't understand the assertion that they are glorifying the livelihoods of these these characters. Anyway, this brings us to the man at the center of the love triangle. What the fuck? What the fuck is wrong with you? Interestingly enough, most people, myself included, came into episode six expecting a Maddie versus Cassie throwdown of epic proportions. Why? Because that's what a lot of contemporary media conditions us to expect. A guy screws over two girls, so who should fight? The girls, of course. But no, episode six instead reaffirmed that Nate Jacobs is the worst character of the three. <laughs> I don't know if worst is the right adjective because it's such a subjective descriptor, but Nate Jacobs is definitely the most dangerous with violent and sociopathic tendencies. I'm a friend of... You're a friend of... A uh, friend of who's? Because you're not my fucking friend. Who the fuck are you friends with, Jules? A popular alpha male, Nate's cold open tells us about his rampant objectification of women. He made a long mental checklist of the things he liked and disliked about women. His need for control and his blunt assessment of the world. It's brutal out there, so he doesn't have time for weakness. He didn't like his mother either. She was weak and a pushover. Within the first two seasons, Nate catfishes Jules and threatens to send her to jail for child porn, beats the shit out of Tyler for sleeping with Maddie, frames Tyler for physically abusing Maddie, reports Fez to the cops, strangles Maddie and throws her into a wall, and finally he breaks into Maddie's apartment and threatens her with a gun. Now often these are just Nate doing bad things to equally bad people, but the way he goes about them are decidedly calculated, with unwavering confidence and no empathy for his victims. Can you imagine if I was sitting here with a gun? Forcing you to accept my apology. I'm gonna press charges because if you do, I'm gonna go to jail for a lot longer than I will. Depending on what I do to you. This is the personality of a narcissistic sociopath, which I think we can trace back to, you guessed it, his dad. She tell you who I am? 
Cal Jacobs is equally forceful and ruthless, with a dominant public personality and the facade of suburban perfection. Nate's life is turned upside down when he discovers Cal's dirty little secret as a small child. Being exposed to that as a little kid, when he probably didn't even know what sex was, rewired his entire outlook on life. And a conversation with his mum in episode 6 confirms that this was the turning point in his personality, and potentially even his sexuality. And then, I don't know, somewhere like around eight or nine, you just, you, you darkened. But Nate's relationship with his dad is a weird power struggle. He seems indebted to his dad due to some misplaced family loyalty, protecting the secret by threatening Jules, but is constantly butting heads with him. This could potentially be because his dad is the only character in the show, other than Rue, Jules and Fezco, who stands up to him, earning his respect. But as Rue states when Cal clears off, Because after an 18 year dick swinging contest with his dad, Nate had finally won. Nate is controlling and domineering over Maddie, telling her to change at the carnival before violently assaulting her. This is in keeping with his abjectly violent personality as he discusses hurting others to protect her. He did, however like to think about the things he'd do to protect her. Despite their combative relationship, Maddie seems to be the girl Nate cares about most. Even once he starts seeing Cassie, he's more interested in Maddie's reaction. It wasn't the 38 missed calls from Cassie that concerned him. It was the fact that there were zero calls from Maddie. Whether this is genuine affection is unclear because it could just be Nate replicating Cal's youth, dating a popular girl to produce the illusion of masculine perfection. This idea also feeds into the implications in the show that Nate might not be strictly heterosexual. I can't explain it to you right now. Yeah, what does that mean? Look, I'm going through a lot of shit right now. Anyway, out of nowhere, Nate ends up sleeping with a very drunk Cassie and the love triangle begins. This leads to some very generic rom-com drama like we covered, which I'm sure a lot of fans will enjoy. Maddie versus Cassie, who gets the hot boy, all that crap. Which yeah, sure, it's a little bit of fun, I enjoyed it, but I'm more impressed with the layers they've given each character leading up to this moment. All three have very different motives and intentions within the relationship, but it doesn't seem like love is one of them, which means the love triangle only serves to emphasize the worst of all these characters. Fucking crazy Maddie is, which you can't seem to fucking comprehend. No, what you don't understand Nate is I am crazier. They're all having a bad time already, but now Maddie and Cassie are fighting with Maddie plotting to kill her. I think I actually want to murder her. And Cassie going as far as to threaten suicide. It's probably the worst possible outcome for everyone involved. As Maddie and Nate now don't have their symbiotic relationship, Cassie will inevitably have her heart broken by Nate and fall deeper into despair, and the associated friend Friendship groups will collapse. I am routinely surprised that some people think that Euphoria doesn't have good character development or writing because like I've just discussed, the characters have mountains of development up to this stage and it provides us with so much context to enter new relationships, new plot developments with such depth. It's not heartwarming, but I guess we'll just have to wait for Lexi's play to see what happens.